Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to First Baptist Blanchard. We are so glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. If you are our guest, we are especially glad that you are here. Would you please do us a favor? In the pew in front of you is this visitor's card. Would you please take it, fill it out, and that gives us a record of your visit and also gives us a way to pray for you. At the end of the service, would you take it to our welcome center and we have a gift we would love to give you. We know that God is going to do some amazing things this morning and we cannot wait to see what it does. So welcome to First Baptist Blanchard. Just a reminder, every Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, Brother Clay is teaching a class called What Every Christian Ought to Know by Adrian Rogers. It's a great time going through that book, so please be there if you can. was basically a career criminal. You know, I, I got involved in criminal lifestyle. I liked it. The streets caught my attention at a young age, at 13. It's the first time I actually got into any kind of criminal activity. I stole marbles out of, out of a store and got caught. But that was the beginning. That's what sparked the mindset of a criminal, I guess. I went to Angola for 10 years, uh, 10 years since, but I only did six. Came home and uh, nothing changed. 22 years old, I found myself heading to Angola for armed robbery, two counts in fact. Sentenced to six to six years flat. That means that you have no parole, no probation. And uh, ultimately I, I went back to court to judge see you a minister society. You'll never see the streets again. Angola State Penitentiary was the bloodiest prison in America. Um, Warden Kane, Earl Kane, um, came in and the Lord began to lay on his heart um, to see this um, prison transformed, to see it changed. So I prayed. I prayed just a simple prayer. You know, I, for a long time, I cried, prayed. to see, God, if you you real, show me, show me. I see my mama for, for years on her knees praying, praying for me. If you real, show me. Show me you real. I, I kept hearing about the Bible college, the Bible college, because I had friends going into the Bible college. Um, the vision was to see these men go through this program, um, be equipped, be trained in biblical studies. From there, they would be sent out as missionaries. So it changed my perspective completely. It changed my heart. The Lord Jesus Christ changed me. I had been up there when Angola was considered the bloodiest prison in the nation. I was there. I lived there. I saw it all. But I tell you what, it enhanced my growth to be involved in this Bible college. And so it has been such a blessing to partner with these guys, to hear their stories, and to try to cast that vision of what God will do and what he's already been doing in their lives. And it really touched my heart. It touched my heart that people care. Their gifts of love their love offering wasn't in vain. Because of that Bible college, there are some men that have changed. It really has changed the whole prison. You know, we always heard there was praying for us, but they didn't know there was time that we got together and we prayed for them and thank God for them, for all they were doing and making this possible. Well, good morning. It's so good to see each of you here this morning. The video reminds us of the need to continue to pray for state missions and to give through the Georgia Barnett offering, which we emphasize each September. Some of you may have recognized Jacob Crawford in that video. He's been with us here in the past for DNAL last year and for some other events. So we hope you'll continue to pray for our state missions. Last Sunday was National Grandparents Day. But because Brother Bill Britt was here for a special weekend emphasis, we've chosen to honor grandparents today. We're calling it Grandparents Day. So if you're a grandparent, we want you to stand. And I'm going to lead us in a prayer in just a moment, but before I do that, I want to share a couple of scriptures that emphasize the importance of grandparents. Proverbs 17, 6 
tells us that grandchildren are the crown of the elderly and the pride of their children. And then Paul reminds us of how important a grandmother was in the life of Timothy when he wrote, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, speaking to Timothy, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. I know I'm proud to be a grandparent. I know many of you are, not only to have grandchildren, but many of you great-grandchildren, and you certainly play an important role in their lives. So let's lead it. let me lead you in a prayer. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful today that we can honor grandparents, great-grandparents, and the role that they play in the lives of our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. We thank you that we have the opportunity to impart faith to them, to encourage them, to pray for them daily as I do for my two grandchildren, Sophie and Saxton. Father, I thank you that we can encourage the parents of our grandchildren, and I pray that you would help us to impart to them the truths of your word, to see them come to know Christ as their Savior when they're old enough to understand their need for Christ, to continue to encourage them in their Christian growth. So bless each of these grandparents and also all of our grandchildren. We pray also that you bless in this service today those who lead us in worship and those who share your word and share testimony of your working in their lives uh, like Jeff and Brother Andrew and Tracy as they come later or others who share. We just pray you'll bless and use us for your honor and glory. And I do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, would you mind standing back up, please? And we're going to worship the Lord this morning. Let's sing this together. In years I spent in vanity and pride, caring that my Lord was crucified. glad to be free in Jesus this morning. Amen. Our soul can have liberty. I love this song, and this is why we're here, is to praise the name of Jesus. And I, I, I just hope that you will forget everybody else around you, forget what's going on, and just worship Him. Let's sing it. 
I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still, and all alone. Come on, church, let's sing this out to him. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless praise, we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Then transfixed on Jesus' face. The one we've sung about, the one we've heard about for years, the one we've been praying to, our faith one day will become sight. Amen. And so I hope some of us can get a little bit more excited than you are right now that we'll get to see the Lord face to face. Everything else will be passed away. Thank God COVID will be done. We ain't got to worry about any sickness or pain. Brother Craig, you ain't got to worry about no foot surgery. Amen. One day, we will see him face to face and everything else won't matter and our gaze, our eyes will be fixed on him. Can we sing that verse one more time? He shall return. He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun oh, shall pierce the night and I will
know what I love is that one day, anyone who has passed away, the last time, if they knew Jesus, the last time they closed their eyes and the next time they opened them, they were looking at heaven. Can you imagine that? If you were to close your eyes right now and would not open them again, the next time you open them, you'd be in the presence of the Lord. And I know some of us, we don't like to talk about death, but I'm afraid it's all too real in the life that we live in this this area of life that we're in. But let me tell you, we, ha- we can have hope in Jesus. Right. Amen. 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 He has been far better to us than we have been to him. That's right. And I love this song. It says, all my life, he has been faithful. Not that we hope he will or hopefully he'll show up, but I, for me, time and time and time again, he has proved himself faithful over and over again. And he didn't have to, but he chose to. And so this morning, we're going to sing this song. All my life, he has been faithful. Can we sing this together? I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up. Till I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so Good. 
Can we sing that one more time? Sing it together. And I surrender all. And I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Father, I pray that that may not just be another song to sing, but Father, would that be the prayer of our heart? that we would want to be surrendered to you, not hold anything back, but, Father, be all in, give you everything that we have. Father, we've tried it our own way. We've tried to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps so many times. But, Father, would we just give in to you? Would we just surrender to you and be the people you've called us to be? Father, I pray over now our service that you would speak to us. Would you speak through our service? Would your spirit be in this place? Would you, it just be so evident that you're here? Father, you talked about in the Old Testament that the trains of your robe would fill the temple. Father, we want to see you fill this place. So, Father, would you, would you do what only you can and speak to our hearts? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, here I am again. First service didn't go so well. I was worried about having enough to say. And uh, so I had the short version, and it went way too long. So now I've just been Xing out everything, going, man, all the stuff I want to say, uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, so Brother Clay asked me to give me my uh, give the COVID testimony, my, my COVID encounter. And, of course, I wanted to decline because I don't do public speaking. And, uh, but since I'm still alive and kicking, I figured, hey, I can do out appreciation for what God's done for me. I, you know, it was really tough because um, it's just not something that I normally do, so we'll see. Um, but I did make this tremendous mistake of telling Brother Clay that um, he's going to have to shorten that rather lengthy sermon. Um, so I have a little time to do it right because I, I like to do things right, you see. And um, so you can imagine how that went. He explained to me, well, I am the sermon, so maybe I won't do that again. <laughs> and you, you, you wouldn't believe, but I mean, I thought people might be excited for me to, you know, give a testimony, but the kind of comments I was getting was things like, well, we might get out of church on time this Sunday. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> I hope I don't disappoint them. Um, so uh, anyway, um, so I've been working on this forever, and I, I thought, well, yesterday I had 16 pages of notes, and so I said, I better give this a trial run and see where I am. And so after that, I was like 54 minutes into it, and I, I got into reading it, and I had bored myself to tears, and I'm like... I'm just going to cut out all these words and um, and try to, you know, try not to do too much readings. There are certain places that I hadn't had enough time, and I'm just going to have to read it, but I'm sorry. But um, anyway, um, so, uh, so you know every church has one of those drummers, the kind that the music minister tries to keep off the stage kind that adds a little extra stress to things. Yeah, that's me. And uh, so you might have noticed how um, we had an awesome drummer back there, and then all of a sudden that changed. And Well, yeah, so um, I'll talk about that here in a minute, but um, um, I've, I've, I've got to cut down my service stuff because the COVID was important. I just went way too long on details that I, I thought were important, but um, so one thing that is important, if you thought my drumming's bad, just wait to hear my message, because I've actually done a little bit of drumming, but speaking, uh -uh. <laughs> um, So I have some special guests here today, and I'm, I'm going to say y'all are safe from any harassment except my boss back there, Russ. No, he's, he's not safe, so just keep that in mind. The rest of you are okay. And for the rest
rest of y'all um, under the bus. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I, I do have to make sure that Brother Clay never invites me back in this pulpit again. Because okay? it's scary, you know. So, so there's one thing that's very important. My, my sound guy back there, Stephen, you know, maybe we work as a team. And we are a lot alike, but, you know, Stephen's pretty sharp sometimes, and sometimes he's five steps ahead of me. And so we work together, and I'm, I'm maybe climbing a ladder trying to drill some holes for some really big speakers. That's what I like to do, you know. And so I get up there, and Stephen's looking at me. He's going, um, hey, Jeff, do you need your drill? And I'm like, oh. So that's why I studied engineering. <laughs> so, and Stephen's also afraid of public speaking. He's been up here and... Uh, and uh, he, he tries to make some notes. I even helped him with it. But the one thing about Stephen is when he finally made it up here, his notes didn't make it with him. So I need you to know that I got my notes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Stephen. So the, the scope that I intend to cover today is serving outside our comfort zone, which I'm going to cut it down brief. Um, and my COVID experience, I'd like to share my personal testimony. Um, and so, uh, so this service thing, it's not about my abilities. Uh, it's just an example of my own life that I can use, that I could demonstrate to you. Um, so these, these, we had two professional drummers here, uh, Chris and Lance, and both of them played professionally. And Chris is comfortable in 150,000 people. You know, he's done that. I'm not comfortable in front of 150. So, you know, there's a little difference there. And I su suspect I'll never be like Chris because I didn't even – pick up drumsticks till I was 52 um, and uh, but you know the church needed some help and and I, I love music and I felt like maybe I could help out the practice not the service just the practice and so that's what I did and they conned me into doing some services and I'm still not comfortable with that but um, I do when I need to and uh, there's been so many people uh, that have stepped up to try to help with leading worship and all kinds of stuff that's not, I mean, we love to put people where they serve well, but sometimes we just have to step up when there's no one else to do it. And so, you know, that's what I've tried to do. I've just done things that I've just never thought I'd have to do here this year. And um, I usually would never do anything like that. Um, so, uh, you know, one thing that's uh, probably key is March 29th is the first time I ever played in service, and it was probably just a couple months before that that I ever touched a drum, so I'm really, really new, and um, so, um, so I've got many visitors here, and I appreciate y'all being here, and uh, i got co-workers, retirees, bosses, former bosses, um, and I, I, I won't you ought to know here at First Baptist Blanchard, whether it's um, Mr. Terrell, um, which was, you know, really probably hired most of us to, you know, the, the laborer, machinist. I mean, when we come to this church, it doesn't really matter whether you're the machinist or the president. We're all God's people and we all work together. And we, we don't really care, you know, who you were at, you know, what company. I mean, we're all, you know, one and... Um, and that, that's the important part of this church is we serve together as a body. I pick on Brother Terrell, and I mean, I mean, he was somebody that when he was my boss's boss, you know, I probably wouldn't have done that. And um, but so um, let's see. So I'm going to move into COVID now. So I, I want to be clear uh, specifically about uh, how this has impacted my life uh, for the past year and a half and what it's like to test positive after being told COVID could be life-changing for me and how that uh, time of sickness went for me. So the purpose of this discussion is not to promote any vaccine or anti-vax platform. or These are personal decisions, and I respect each person's decision. Um, regardless of what it is, and I also 
enjoy listening to each person's thought on the matter because we learn from each other. Um, so, got the thing scribbled out. So uh, I need that picture of my sister um, of the Belchers um, coach. So even I think I'm ringing just a hair. Um, oh, by the way, Steve, do we have anybody from Georgia and Florida dialed in yet? Need to know that. Um, okay. Good, good. So we have um, some troublemakers dialed in from Georgia, Ackworth to be exact. And you know our live stream's behind by about 90 seconds, so I suspect you know my phone will be going crazy here in a minute when they figure out I'm talking about them. That's okay. And uh, there's the troublemakers. And so, um, so you see, there's uh, there was this problem here. The the daughter got sent home from school because of this COVID thing. We didn't understand, and everybody, you know, everybody's going crazy. And going from all these friends, all of a sudden, like you know, locked down in the Ponderosa here and not hanging out with friends and going out to the real world, you know, was tough. So um, she was looking for um, a professional opinion on how COVID relates to me because she's having a hard time believing that, you know, it, it would be that, that bad for me. So my wonderful sister that just says it like it is, Nurse Stephanie, was willing to deliver so I, I happened to intercept, intercept that, that text, and it's like, oh, wow, okay. Now, this was a year ago, but uh, it says, this virus is not a flu. It's a multi-systematic virus. Your dad has many comorbidities that would make him more susceptible to this virus. He might not die if he got it. I'm thinking that's the more positive part. Um, but... He would most likely go downhill quickly, be intubulated, placed in an induced coma for several weeks. He would most likely have years of lingering and debilitating side effects that occur when someone has been in, intubulated in the ICU for a length of time. Well, that really don't sound too good. Um, so the problem is, you know, she was probably correct about that. Um, and it was really good that a year and a half later where we know a little more um, because uh, COVID could have quite an impact on me and we know a little bit more uh, how to treat it and understand it a little better uh, but I don't want to take any credit away from the prayers and the miraculous healing power of God which I think had a big part my, my pastor just wears God out you know <laughs> and they're please please you know it's like okay okay I he, he will keep asking, and I appreciate my pastor's prayers and the support he's, he's given me through this and all of y'all's. Um, so, um, you know, my, my mom is a, a nurse also, and she goes to the nth degree with everything. That may be an understatement. But, uh, well, nurse mom had to pull a doctor's role at times in her life and prove that her capabilities go far beyond a typical nurse. In fact, she's a cancer survivor. When she got cancer, she told her doc that she wasn't doing that chemo stuff. Um, the doc said, you're going to die without the treatment. And she said, hey, I got a plan. Give me a chance. And so um, he finally did, and, and so she implemented such. And she turned that cancer, and the doc began to study her plan because it was so successful. And that was so many years ago, and she's still cancer-free. Um, since nurse mom's not quite as blunt as my dear sister, she just simply said, I need to stay at home. So, you know, those Home Depot and Lowe's trips and stuff, sometimes, you know, you sneak out at 7 in the morning. It's just, uh, you got to have them. It's a, life's just not worth living without going to Home Depot. Or <coughs> <laughs> now, now, my mom's quite conservative when it comes to germs and viruses and uh, you know, she snuck over here. She hadn't, you know, two years I didn't see them. And so they slid by to try to see a glimpse of me. And I wanted to meet my, my pastor, Brother Clay. And, man, he, he showed up, and he's like, you know, 20 feet downwind. I'm like, 
Mom, Mom this, is, this is my pastor. That doesn't matter. Oh, hi, brother. brother. Nice to meet you. <laughs> okay, 20 feet downwind. <laughs> and, uh, well, pastor understood, but, but yeah, she's, she's a stickler, and she, uh, I, I really worried about COVID for my stepdad, and, and so it's, it's just been a really uh, bad deal for them. And so thirdly, um, I visited with the doc about six months ago, my well visit, and then again about a week ago for another well visit. And um, six months ago, he was, you know, I, I said, okay, doc. I said, so if I get this COVID, I said, you're going to be able to save me? He's like, well, Jeff, I just don't know. I'm like, okay, let me ask the question again. So if I get COVID, are you going to just watch me die? You're going to give me every drug in the book? He said, oh, yeah, I'm going to give you this and this and this. Everything that I, that I know is, I've been successful with, I'm going to teach you. I said, okay, that's good. We needed to know that. Thank you. So, so yes, um, I, I needed him, and he, and he come through. Um, so I've learned through all this that Kobe and I, you know, we worried about compatibility there. Um, so sequence of events, uh, Friday evening, August 20th, um, I was, you know, a little bit tired and congested, and I thought, well, maybe some allergies. Saturday, I was kind of fatigued all day. I kind of kept my distance from others. I had some, um, I had some commitments, uh, Roger and stuff, and I tried to, you know, try to keep some distance because I've been through this several times, and it was always a sinus infection. But you never know. But it, it did seem like a sinus infection, and. Um, I just was tired, and so I started making some contingency plans in case anything happened, because it doesn't matter if I wake up with a fever, I'm, I'm done until we figure it out. So that Sunday morning, August 22nd, um, at 5 a.m., I had a fever, uh, near 100, and so uh, I hit the Healthcare Express, and, um, and you know, and the, got tested and got right in, so there's 15 minutes from the time that you you know you get the test and you got to wait around. And so this time I felt that something was different. And so you know I'd served. I told a, I've been telling everybody that you know one time I just wouldn't come to church. I got Stephen to try to fill in while I was at home and I watch it. And and then you know they we just had 10 people here and I'd come and then we brought the congregation back in and all this stuff and. So when the congregation come back in, Brother Clay, you know, that's that's a risk. That's high risk. Uh, I've got to be careful, so I don't know what I'm going to do. But as I saw, I was going to go on and on and on, and I said, okay, I'm, 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 God says to, to serve. We need each other. We can't just sit at home. And um, so, you know, I've got to be there. i got to, I got to help people. Uh, we got to bind together. Um, and so, you know, that's the risk. I, I'll be careful at Walmart. So when I go to, I'm going to go to church, and if it costs me my life, well, it's a great place to die. You know, that's that's where I was on things. We're all going to die, so when's it going to happen? And so now I'm sitting there going, now I'm fixing to eat these words. Um, so I said that, and now I'm under the test. I said I'm worried about something being different today. I've done this many times. Life was good. I said, but today I can. I don't. I'm not prepared for positive. You know, so I prayed and prayed and prayed. Said I, I need need help here. I need strength. And so I felt good about it before the, the doc come back in. He said, "Oh, you're positive." Oh, okay. He's like, well, he had eight out of forty positive the, the, the previous day, so it's no big deal. Positive, positive, positive. And I'm like, okay. Um, so I said, "Well, my doctor's prepared to treat me, so you don't have to worry about me. I'm gonna, you know, get home my doctor." And and so I, I, that's what I did. I left, and it was 9.22, and I was like, oh, Brother Clay better be done with that sermon. I'm like, first service by now. By golly, I'm calling him. And I told him, and I guess I sounded a little a little stressed. He, goes, he said, you know, Jeff, this doesn't have to be a death sentence. And I'm like, really? Okay. Sounds good to me. I'll take that. So, so, um, so I went through all that, and so... Um, got home and I started I had to inform my mom and my, my boss and stuff I worried about both of them um, and so I started getting all these texts and you 
you know, I'd already had all these home treatment plans he'd sent me, so now I started watching all those videos and reading those treatment plans and managing all those texts, and so I started doing all these things that she was saying with all the vitamins, um, and then that, that was on Sunday, and it, it wasn't it wasn't going so good, you know. Um, I was starting to feel the effects of where this was going, and nausea, and I was losing my appetite, um, fever, tired, trying to sleep, and I was like, oof, so, and stopped up head, and so Monday, I, I was about the same way, maybe a little worse, started having, feeling a little pressure on my chest, and I was like, ooh, it's way too early for that mess, and, but I, I felt like I was hold, holding my own, and the, the doctor kicked in and started giving me the the drugs that he said he would, and also scheduled me for an infusion, which I didn't know you really typically had to be 65 to get that, but I'd asked him for it, and he managed to get it for me since I was high risk. And so that, um, i tell you, that, that maybe that Monday afternoon I started turning, and I'm like, this is awesome. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm all right. I'm going to be okay. And it, it went uphill from there, and I, I just ate and ate and ate. <laughs> I just, I just couldn't get enough, like couldn't get enough food. I was just hungry all the time, and, and I drank a gallon of water a day. And um, so, uh, extremely thankful, and it wasn't wasn't too bad. But uh, you know, I started doing everything at the very beginning, and had so many people praying for me. So there's a few. Um, basic um, things I've learned in, in this time about COVID, just practical examples. Um, you know, my all these treatment plans and stuff, I can see anybody if they're interested, but um, it's very important to be knowledgeable and take charge of your own illness. Your doctor's, you know, overwhelmed right now with seriously ill patients and does not um, see you every day and, you know, doesn't really know what's going on with you necessarily. So you know your condition better than the rest. So complacency can lead to death. So make sure you, you know you take charge of your health. Um, you cannot just let COVID run its course and hope it'll be fine. I mean, you, you've got to be proactive and change your diet. I had to drop all the sugar. Where's Brother Dale? No ice cream. That was a killer. As I got to feeling better, I was thinking, just a little scoop of ice cream would be so good. And I could just hear mom, is you eating ice cream? And um, drinking lots and lots of water, not soft drinks, and resting. Um, and uh, so when you figure out it's not going well, sometimes it's just too late. So don't get to that point. And there's some home treatment plans by very respected doctors. Um, these are very helpful. and and are not always easily to locate. Um, so I'll be glad to share them with you. And some doctors are very good about treating COVID at early stages, and some of them do nothing until you're in the hospital. So I'd make sure you have one of those doctors that actually wants to help you. It'd be, uh, be good. So, um, you, you know, after going through all this, um, you, you, sometimes your priorities change. So um, I kind of want to demonstrate what what COVID will do to a high-risk person, you know, after a year and a half. So I need that picture back up there, Coach. Um, so I need to explain to my sister um, that, you know, uh, your brother's coming to see you, okay? I need you to prepare a spot in your garage for, for my home on wheels. And, uh, you know, I like your homemade biscuits and gravy. And that restaurant in downtown Ackworth at Henry's Louisiana Grill, that's better Louisiana food than I think I've had here. So, so I, I want to go there. And, yeah, I'm going to be taking that thing there to so find a place for it. Um, and uh, you might want to put, put uh, the next picture up, Coach. Um, I might need to talk. No, no. Where's Mom? No, back up. Back up. There she is. Okay, hey, uh, Mom, I need to tell you something. I know you're kind of afraid of me, and I can bring a stack of COVID tests if you need me to, but I'm bringing that camper, and I'm coming to see you, okay? 
very soon. Hey, boss, uh, Russ, so um, I'm going to need a little time off. i got to go see my, my sister. I think you, you understand. You've already, you know, pretty good with that. But one thing for sure, I'm thinking I might need to be on the payroll while I'm at Mom's. I, I need to work remotely. I hope Central Florida is remote enough because if I'm not on that payroll, she's going to make this list for me to do so long. We want to get to visit, so, you know, I need something to keep me from, uh, save me from her list, if that's okay. Um, so, uh, I, I, that's what, that's what I, I'm going to do, is I, I want to see people. I want to go, um, you know, that's what's important, and, and this has really put distance from families, and it's just, I, I'm just tired of it. So that, that's the end of the COVID. Um, uh, I wanted to get a um, since Brother Clay uh, gave me the whole sermon. Um, oh, uh, <laughs> Brother Clay, not Terrell. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, Brother Clay wouldn't be happy with me. I didn't share my testimony, so um, I thought I would do that. Um, so when I was in early college, I adopted Romans 8.28 as one of my favorite scriptures because, you know, times were challenging and, and you're trying to figure out your way and, and Romans 8.28 was, you know, trying to explain that all things work uh, for the good of those that, you know, actually are in his, you know, for Christians, essentially. Sometimes we miss that. Or they just work for the good. Well, I mean, for those that love him, to keep his word. Um, so um, at age 12 in uh, 1980, I was saved at a James Robinson crusade in Conway, Arkansas. Mr. Robinson must have discussed uh, salvation in depth that night. Now, my grandmother was a spiritual influence in my life in my younger years. She would line up her lady friends all around and pray for the Holy Ghost to come upon me. Those ladies were sincere with their praying for me, but also felt bad how each of them would have to go to the hairdresser the next day after their hair had to be restacked because, you know, they, they prayed so hard for me. Um, you see, they, they were earnest in their praying, and they, they would wreck that hairdo. Um, well, those precious ladies failed to talk about the basics of the Christian walk. Mr. Robinson, I'm sure, explained how we sin every day, no matter how good we are. Heaven and sin just don't go together. He said in the Old Testament, those folks are always sacrificing animals to cover their sins because someone or something had to die for sin. But 2,021 years ago, uh, Jesus, uh, God sent Jesus here to teach us and demonstrate to us the way. He was perfect in every way, and he set an incredible example for us. He suffered a brutal death that was completely undeserved. Um, that death was very necessary to cover our sins. But it also demonstrated how the world is going to treat us uh, or treat those that follow Christ and biblical principles. You see, in America, it used to be easy to be a Christian. That is quickly becoming more difficult as Christians are mocked and accused of being judgmental, haters, intolerant. We are not judgmental. The Bible lays out what we are to do and what we're not to do, how we're to live and how we're not to live. Jesus gives purpose to our life. So many do not understand why they even exist. What is their place in this world? And maybe, um, you know, even spend a lifetime trying to figure that out. But Jesus said, come and follow me. Many denominations, including ours, call this a salvation experience. John 3.16 talks about Jesus is the only way. You have to believe in him and ask him to forgive of your sins. This is a turning moment. We feel you feel Jesus convicting you to make a decision to do this. This is what I did at age twelve. Jesus then says you need to confess you know that that decision. You need to profess um, that you know that you've accepted Jesus into your life. And so that's where I walk down in the crusade or at my church say I've made this decision. A lot of times we walk here in the, up to the pastor and you know, say uh, either I want to be saved or I have been and you're, you're telling the pastor that's what you do. So 
So after doing so, I was baptized, I believe in April, in a horse trough that was full of very cold water. Um, this is what Jesus um, did and is part, um, is part partly communicating to others, you know, that we buried the old person and uh, raised the new person in Christ that comes out of the water. This is just the first step. Then we spend a lifetime learning and growing in Christ. At that crusade, these, these principles were communicated, and I was convicted. Now, if you have always thought that this is just religious stuff, you've sometimes heard from these you know, lunatics on the street corners with their Bible. Um, you, might, you might think about our calendar year. You know, I just kind of looked it up a little bit. 2021 A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord Jesus Christ. This event is so significant that the world bases their calendar on it that in many places we're not even allowed to talk about Jesus. Well, that's really interesting. Um, so anyway, there was many challenges in my childhood, but, but I'm thankful for each as they have helped me uh, be who I am today. And uh, with Jesus in my life, I had the tools to manage whatever life you know, threw at me. Um, so, part of my story, besides my uh, testimony, is that I, how I got here, you know, I was in central Arkansas, Mayflower, Arkansas, went to school in Conway, um, graduated in Fayetteville, and um, so, you know, Swepco brought me to Shreveport, and I really don't think I had lost anything in Shreveport and wasn't for sure why I would have needed to come here. But, um, yeah, well, I had, I had no job. There was very few jobs being offered those days and, and no money and debt. And so, um, yeah, I was thinking, well, Shreveport wasn't looking too bad so far. But, um, so, I, this, this, this story tells a little bit about how living your Christian principles outside the church can change, you know, change things, change the world, really. Now, I have to lay a little groundwork for people to really understand this, so hang with me, Mr. Terrell, as we track through the mud and yuck to get to the mountaintop. So my first boss, Gary Dutton, which I don't think was able to make it, he, he had a, a, a death, uh, several of us had deaths here lately, um, made a decision to hire me, uh, most likely after running out of options. And Mr. Terrell had to put the stamp of approval on that. Now, Gary had, he had hired many engineers, but they all seemed to leave him. So I think he had reached the point where he just wanted someone that would stay. And uh, so uh, I had envisioned working for one of those companies with the glossy brochures, you know, Texas Instruments and Big D. I mean, I was young, and that sounded awesome. You know, boring pirate company, goodness. Um, I wasn't so sure about. So it wasn't on the top of my list. And you know, um, yeah, I got the name Doogie Tucker EE. E. I think you'll see why. <laughs> they were thought I was somebody's um, son, one of the power plant people. Um, so you might want to put uh, my resume up there, Coach. Um, Mr. Tyrell, I think, desired to hire someone that appeared to be a quick learner and preferably some experience, and my transcript really didn't uh, reflect either. <laughs> no, 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 the first one, that one. There was, I think those are the only two things that I'm just imagining, the only two things he liked. One of them was that I was uh, graduated the University of Arkansas, and the other I was involved in church. And I, uh, so... I had something going, but I think the, really the, the thing was there just wasn't any other options. So he said, okay, we'll give him a chance. So now what I was thinking is I believe um, uh, if, if he knew that someday I would come to his church and wreck the sound, I mean the serenity and quietness in this church before I came, and, you know, subwoofers, uh, drums, and even worse, play the drums. I mean, there was some, some Sundays where we didn't have any drums. 
I mean, those are probably good Sundays for him. And now, that doesn't happen much. I'm just wondering, where's that other one? I'm thinking if he knew the future, Coach. Um, oh, the one previous to that. Uh, that that's, that's coming. That's Sunday night. That's Sunday night. Uh, yeah, that's what he would have done. Yeah. So, so, yeah, Kurt, he's, you know, you see him up here. He's trying to play the piano. He had to do everything by himself. No, no support up here. So I've often wondered, you know, to help improve my, my drumming skills that, um, you know, maybe I could help him out and I might could get good and be um, like Coach had up there. You know, ring that back up there. I mean, that, that's the future for me, maybe after, you know, the next decade. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Mr. Terrell. I'm sorry. But it's it's going to be bad for you. <laughs> um, well... Anyway, um, I'm very glad that Mr. Terrell hired me, and I believe he feels the same way um, most of the time. So as I continue to harass him today, I do need to be clear that I would not be here today if God had not brought a Christian man in that position that gave me a chance, even though my credentials did appear a little bleak. I also owe credit to my direct boss at the time, Gary Dutton, for seeking me out and, and spending time with me and giving me a chance. So y'all would not know me. If it wasn't for Mr. Terrell, none of y'all would know me. Um, everything would be way different. So I've learned over time that me and my coworkers, friends, and um, Swepco, you know, you hired. Um, and you've hired people that were really, um, you know, people that have become my friends. And... And that, that's just awesome. Now, um, you, have, you did have a passion for being a bit economic. And, and with, with having some parts of, um, you know, having a part in all the construction of all our plants and how they were staffed, believe it or not, Swepco had the lowest prices around and was kind of a model for AEP. So I believe you took your Christian principles outside these four walls and applied them at work. And I believe you've contributed to help in our workplace remind us of our church place. People treating each other as family, good values, work ethic. It, it makes work a great place to be. You've also helped so much around here by you know, changing the light bulbs and cleaning my sound closets and bush hogging and weed eating, not to mention traveling the world doing mission work that you've done um, previously. So... Uh, now I have began. I've been. I've wondered a long time. Um, I hadn't figured it out though. But there's just so many people seem to be afraid of you. I mean, they act like they've seen a ghost when I mention your name. You know, I, I just wonder if they saw the Holy Ghost. Our department did have a reputation for being a the redheaded stepchild of the of the bunch um, te until people figured out that Generation is the only part of the company that actually makes money. Now they all want to be part of us. Um, so I did hear a rumor that you had to be a member of FBC Blanchard to get a job in, you know, in your area, especially CMF, but you said that wasn't true. But, but, um, but there are plenty of us around here. I also heard um, that, that even the former president refuses to call you by your first name, even though everybody calls her by her first name. So I don't know what you've done, but, man, people, you put the fear of God in them. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, I better. I got just a few minutes, don't I? Okay. So I, I need, um, yeah, I wonder if you could put the, um, go go forward a little bit, Coach. Right there. Is there one previous to that? Yeah. So, um, so you know, we've had to go on a lot of trips and uh, doing things, and I, I got, 
I, I ended up having to go to Colorado for two weeks. I love Colorado, but I mean, two weeks straight. And you know, we had multiple things going on, and it's like, wow. So you know what you, what you do is take your boss. I, I'll fix the problem. So yeah, I took my boss, and, um, and so we, we, we had to go for two weeks. No, no, back it up, back it up. You're going too far, back it up. Go back to the Jeep Grand Cherokee. Yeah, so my boss has like six kids, you see, and um, so they, of course, they stick with company policy, you get a Ford Taurus or whatever. Three guys, two weeks of luggage, it ain't fitting in the Taurus. So, I, you know, I talked to them and said, hey, you know, we can SUV, four-wheel drive, you know, nav, sunroof, you know, something. Oh, yeah, we, we got you fixed up. $10 more a day, I think. So you see uh, Russ is still a little disappointed in that decision because ten days ten dollars a day is a lot of money when you have six kids. So, you know, he's trying to get over that, but but man did we have a good Roger, it was trail rated. We had some fun. Um, it was a, it was good when we wasn't working. Now, um, you know, so now we got Father's Day and we're not home for our kids, so Russ comes up with this idea. This is not your 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 electric bill at work though okay we 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 pulled money out of our pockets for this but yeah so uh, right there in the front that would be him and go to the next one yeah so every now and then we got to experience things i'd never traveled before schlepco uh, i'm in very few places and uh, so i got to have some real experience um, so There's another picture next, Coach. Um, no, I was supposed to get rid of that. I went to Niagara Falls and I was in, yeah, I was in Niagara. Keep going. Yeah. So, all the people in my work, for the most part, got to start a new power plant up. And I, you know, I, I'd come in after that point. And it was a kind of a love-hate relationship. It would be a nice thing, but then I knew it would be just so much time away from home, and it would be hard on my family. So I kind of wanted to wait around to the last minute, but I sure want to get a little experience with that because there's a lot to learn. So finally, in like 2012, uh, we built this new plant, and it it was a very difficult thing. Well, sometimes they have good days. I really like that one, um, but. We built this new plant, and it was probably the last coal unit built, or the next to the last in this country, the cleanest coal in this country. And I got to help start it up and work with all those people that, um, uh, that the experts all over the, the country. And I just had no idea of what that opportunity would be. It, it was difficult, but seven days a week. Um, but Wow, uh, I, I never dreamed it would be the last power plant built, and um, it was. Um, it had to go on in 2012. Uh, we had this boss lady who was trying to say we, we got to get it on, and it's like I was going. There is no way. And I got there. There's no way. And obviously, I heard she gave some motivational speeches, and I missed them, but I, I needed them because I, I didn't have the message. But but we did, December 12th of 2012, we went commercial. And so that was, that was incredible for me and, and such a blessing. I just had no idea at the time. And not to mention that even in the control room, we had to do a commercial and Dale Earnhardt Jr. was in there and I got to come within a few feet from him. And my boss was, can't even get close enough to get a picture. So he's a little, a little envious of me on that one, but that was a pretty good experience too. So, um, I've not always been the brightest or the fastest engineer in the company, but I have always tried to apply biblical principles to my everyday work, and, and doing so has helped me to be successful despite my many weaknesses. And as you can see, Swepco's provided those opportunities that I had no idea. Uh, so God brought me here. I didn't know it. It just didn't give me any options. That's the way I like it. I don't like to have to make those decisions. I didn't have any decisions, and brought me here, and it's it's um, uh, it's just been the best thing ever. So I just cannot imagine. Um, so 
I want to thank you. I better end it there. Proud of him. Hey, that's hard to do, right? Get up here in front of a bunch of folks and some, some of your co-workers and all that kind of stuff like that and to just share testimony of how good God is. And, um, you know, God's faithful. He's brought you in a lot of places. Um, I'll never forget that, that call when he, I was in my office and, and uh, he had been telling me for, for like a year, man, if I get COVID, man, I think it's the kiss of death. And I'm like, I'm telling you, it's not. You know, God is greater. God is in control. God is stronger. And you know what? God knows every number of your days. And so we had talked about all that. So when he called me that day, I had already used that scripture in a verse, in a message and whatnot. And I told him, I said, man, you just got to give thanks for this. God's going to pull you through. And when he does, I want you to share your testimony. And so that, that's what it's about. God, God brought him through a, a marvelous journey in life. And, and, and we're just appreciative of what God's doing.